Hello, I'm Jim Acosta in for Wolf Blitzer. Name calling and news. President Trump fires back at the North Korean devastation behind. But first, the war of words between nuclear powers. After President Trump attacked North Korea and Iran this week at the United Nations, the leaders of both countries thumbing their noses at the president in dramatic ways. First, an extraordinary exchange of insults between the leaders of the U.S. and North Korea this morning. President Trump called Kim Jong-un a madman in a tweet after a statement by the North Korean leader was carried on state TV where he called Mr. Trump a, quote, mentally deranged U.S. Goddard and a frightened dog. That was in response to a speech at the U.N. where the president repeatedly called Kim the rocket man. On top of that, Iran just announced a new long-range ballistic missile capable of carrying multiple warheads. Let's talk more about the situation in North Korea. Senior international correspondent Ben Wiederman is in Tokyo. Ben, uh, tell us more about Kim Jong-un's response to the president's U.N. remarks and the latest threat of a hydrogen bomb coming from Pyongyang. Uh, things are escalating quickly. Yeah, this statement from Kim Jong-un was published on KCNA, which is the official state uh, news agency. And this is really the first time any Korean leader, and there are North Korean leader, and there have only been three since 1945, has directed such a statement in the first person singular. And really, it's just sort of one insult after the other. He calls President Trump a rogue and a gangster. And he ends the statement saying, I will surely and definitely tame the mentally deranged U.S. dotard with fire. Now, the original Korean actually is not dotard, obviously. Uh, the original Korean statement, uh, it's actually old lunatic. Now, this sort of crude, vivid language uh, is unusual in a society like Korea where age commands respect. But in this case, Jim, uh, the statement is oozing with the lack of it. Now, regarding uh, this threat about the possible use or explosion or detonation of a hydrogen bomb, that came from the North Korean foreign minister who is attending the United Nations General Assembly. He said, after this original statement was issued by Kim Jong-un, uh, that Korea might, North Korea might detonate a hydrogen bomb over the Pacific. Now, if that were the case, and nobody really knows at this point uh, whether concrete plans are being made to do so, it would be the first atmospheric nuclear test since China conducted one in 1980 in the western part of the country. Now, we've seen, for instance, uh, on the 3rd of September, Korea, North Korea conducted its sixth nuclear test. It's conducted a variety of ballistic missile tests, including uh, two in the last month over Japan. Now, if they combine the two, a missile tipped with a hydrogen bomb, that would be a massive escalation. Jim. All right. The reality TV rhetoric getting a little too real. Uh, ben Wiedemann, thank you very much. I want to discuss now here with me is seen in political and national security analyst David Sanger. He is also the national security correspondent for The New York Times and former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State Heather Conley. She's now the Senior Vice President for Europe and Eurasia at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, David, how, how extraordinary is this? I remember I was uh, filling in on Situation Room last night when the statement came in from Kim Jong-un. It was remarkable in that it came directly from him. Typically, we hear the, the sort of tough talk coming from state media and so on. Uh, but this came directly from Kim Jong-un. What, what does that mean and how significant is that? Well, it's unusual. He has not talked about President Trump directly very much. As you say, it's come from state media. President Trump's talked about him. Sure. Uh, but it was the speech at the U.N. that appears to have um, set this off. And look, as long as it remained a war of words like this uh, with the president this morning, uh, with his, his tweet and what uh, Kim Jong-un said, I think people would be concerned, but not particularly exercised. What's different, and you heard it from Ben's description, was this very specific threat from the North Korean foreign minister that North Korea might conduct an atmospheric test. Now, that doesn't sound like a big difference in the previous six tests. It's a big difference. And the reason is the previous six tests have all been contained inside, underground. underground. Yeah. Radioactivities contained, you're not worried about the winds by and large. An atmospheric test, which the United States and Soviet Union agreed to ban in 1963, early days of the Cold War, is a very different thing. Hard to control, hard for North Korea perhaps to pull off. 
will definitely raise the stakes in the U.S. about how it would respond uh, to the North, whether to respond preemptively, whether to respond after such a test. It would also alienate the North Koreans, I think, in many ways, and the Chinese, who do not want to see radioactive clouds floating around the Pacific. And, and Heather, uh, just to pick up on what David was saying there, I mean, how, uh, what is your uh, sense of this when the North Koreans are talking about an atmospheric test of a hydrogen bomb as David said, the atmospheric conditions could make this a, a real nightmare for that region. It's absolutely a regional nightmare, and that's why we're seeing such extraordinary concern from the Japanese government, Prime Minister Abe, President Moon of South Korea. I mean, this is, again, these words are important. They matter. And we're really getting a textbook lesson on why diplomacy, you don't make it personal. You don't use such escalatory language because there's only way you keep climbing up. And this is very dangerous. We have underestimated the North Korean threat for years now. And I think we have to start taking this very, very seriously. We have to find a path for de-escalation and uh, using a war of words. That may be okay for the playground, but that is not okay for an incredibly serious moment for Asia Pacific. We've got to start de-escalating this, but I just don't see where we are with our two leaders sort of locked in a war of words. This is very, very serious. It's hard to find an off-ramp uh, when the president is tweeting something like this. We can put this up on screen. It says uh, Kim Jong-un of North Korea, who obviously is a madman, doesn't mind starving or killing his people, will never be, will be tested like never before. Um, David, uh, you know, how, how do they de-escalate things? It seems as though, you know, when you hear from the White House, uh, they, they love this criticism that comes from the Beltway, that comes from the Acela Corridor of the president's tweets. They, they feel as though we don't get it and that he gets it. He, the American people get it. His supporters get it, but we don't get it. But this is not the same thing. We're talking about national security issues of the highest importance. We're not talking about political issues that perhaps he has a better sense of than we do. Well, the president, he's used his tweets in the past to appeal to his base and, as he says, frequently to talk directly to the American people. The difficulty is, in this case, you want to be talking specifically to Kim Jong-un, and you've got to recognize that in his culture as well, backing down is as hard as it may be or maybe even harder than it is for President Trump. And the reason for that is that the only thing that's holding the regime together right now, given the state of their economy, given the shortages of food, given the, the, the reign of terror that he's got there, which the president accurately portrayed in the, in the tweet, is this sense that the nuclear weapons that North Korea has developed have brought North Korea, this tiny, starving country, up to a level with the United States. And it's been a real gift to, to it, Kim Jong-un. It has been. Yeah. And look, we're yeah. sitting here talking about the leader of a country we would barely be referring to if he didn't have nuclear weapons. We're talking to, on par with the U.S. president. And, and of course, and, they're watching us all the time. And, and, and Heather, let me ask you this. I've heard, it, I've heard it said since the president's speech that when the president went out to the U.N. and threatened to wipe out North Korea, that he gave Kim Jong-un something of a, of a gift again back back home because no, he doesn't have to say it. The, the state media doesn't have to say it. They can just play the clip of President Trump saying this uh, inside North Korea. Right. No, and it, and it does continue to give, give Kim Jong-un a, a lot of power to continue to, as the president said in his tweet, continue to harm the people of North Korea because it gives him a reason to keep cracking down because he has an external threat, which is now the United States. Uh, so, yes, it raises this to a level. It makes it very personal. And I have to say, in some ways, this is burying the, the White House's lead. They, uh, the, the sanctions that they just laid down are really significant. Yeah, impressive. And, yeah. and they've, that's been buried. That's important. That's what will try to break some change. So let's tone down the language. Let's get down to the policy action and let Let's try to work on denuclearizing the North Korea Peninsula, not this war of words. It's, it'll be interesting to see if they can do more than just uh, have one kind of message coming out of this White House. Uh, David Singer, Heather Conley, thank you very much for that. I uh, want to keep moving because it's a fast-moving news day. I uh, want to turn now to the desperate situation unfolding in Puerto Rico in the wake of Hurricane Maria. If you're away from your screen, you want to take a look at this a dramatic rescue that was captured by the U.S. Coast Guard uh, just off of Puerto Rico. You can see a rescuer being lowered there. Uh, take a look at this, and if you look closely at this shot, you'll see 
a woman and two children balancing on top of a capsized ship. There it is right there, just remarkable, waving their arms for help. According to the Coast Guard, all three were saved. The body of a man, however, was found inside the, the ship. On land, the situation appears to be just as desperate. There's widespread flooding, some buildings that are uninhabitable, and the entire island, island again, is without power. The mayor of San Juan says rescue operations are still underway at this hour. So I got an SOS from that elderly orphanage, and it was uh, a text like from a horror movie. It said, if anyone can hear us, please. We are stuck here. We can't get out, and we have no power, and we have very little water left. So we got there just in time. It was a very touching moment. If I can save one life, uh, that would be good enough, but I have too many to save. So. CNN's Layla Santiago is live in San Juan. Layla, the mayor there, is sounding very desperate. Uh, she says a recovery plan is in place, uh, but they have to take things one day at a time. What's the priority at this moment? I, I suppose it has to be the power uh, because it is just so widespread there on the island. Right. The power is only part of it, Jim, because officials have already told me that will take months to restore resources now coming in uh, with FEMA on planes, on ships, but the, the priority will be distribution. Uh, I want to kind of walk you around the kind of places that we're seeing right now. Uh, you can see how this home ended, or a part of a home rather, ended. And this is a roof. You can see a fan. All of this, by the way, comes from that blue building. How do I know that? I talked to the gentleman that lives there that says, yes, this is part of my roof here. You can even see doors on the ground. People's personal lives just on full display after Hurricane Maria. And so when you hear the mayor of San Juan getting so emotional, I mean, it really is representative of what we are hearing and seeing on the streets. The government really dealing with a logistical nightmare because even they admit they have not been able to reach uh, parts of the island. And, and when I say reach, I don't mean just by phone. I mean by roads. These roads are flooded, filled with debris, just like this. So power, a problem, communication, a problem. But for the people that are coming out and seeing this type of damage, like Jose Ortega, the gentleman whose roof is now standing in front of me, it is easy to understand why they are so emotional. And, and he says he's waiting. He's waiting for help to arrive. And so that is a big priority, Jim. Uh, resources now coming in. New York has sent a plane full of water, full of generators and food. But allocating that will be a big challenge. Uh, I can see it's, it's just going to take months and months for them to recover down there in Puerto Rico. And, of course, you're staying on top of it. Uh, Leila Santiago, thank you very much. Puerto Rico, of course, is not the only island ravaged by Hurricane Maria. I want to bring in. Our meteorologist Chad Myers. Uh, Chad, what an incredible storm mm -hmm. uh, that just devastated Puerto Rico there. Uh, take yes. us along Maria's path and help us understand just how much damage has been inflicted so far. Sure. Let's start five days ago when the storm was just a tropical storm and the Leeward, Windward Islands here, Dominica right there. The storm was really nothing. It was 60 miles per hour. We move you ahead about 12 hours and all of a sudden it's a category one hurricane. So the people of Dominica and Martinique saying, all right, let's batten down the hatches. This is getting worse. But in 15 hours, this storm went to a Category 5 right over Dominica. And this is what the pictures look like from Dominica. I was actually there in 2005, maybe 2006, on a cruise ship. The people there were absolutely the most hospitable, lovely people ever. We went up to a place called the Emerald Pool, swam in this beautiful rainforest, and it was just an amazing, an amazing adventure. That's going to take a long time to recover. Then the storm exited Dominica, and it just clipped Guadeloupe near Vieux Fort, which is Old Fort, Old Vieux Fort, um, and across the area here, the southern Guadeloupe, and there was quite a bit of damage there, but not as much as Dominica. Now we fly you over here to St. Croix. St. Croix was the next in the line of islands to be hit by this. Significant damage in Frederickstead and the entire island itself, but a glancing blow, not a center 
core punch of the eye itself, but the eye wall. And many times we say the eye wall is worse than the eye. The eye is calm, but it's the eye wall that did hit St. Croix. We have a helicopter on the way with reporters today to get better video of this because it's been a forgotten little place because it was so hard to get to. Couldn't get there with the weather that's been the past three days. Now we move you ahead to the morning hours as it made landfall right through Puerto Rico and across just south of San Juan. All of a sudden from a category four to a category one because it was so torn up so much damage was inflicted on puerto rico that the storm almost killed itself we go from there we move you ahead to the dominican republic and that's where we are now here's the flooding from the dominican republic the wind damage from the dr there was a lot of mountain ranges that are just to the south of where that eye was and those mountain ranges caught the water and that water ran downhill now we go to Turks and Caicos, that's where we are now. The damage will be on the islands that are in the eastern part of the Turks and Caicos, but that's where it is, and that's the logistics of a storm that went from Cat 1 to Cat 5, back to 4, hit Puerto Rico, now to 1, now to 2, now to 3. Jim. Incredible, Chad. And I've been down in the Caribbean, I know you have as well, and so many folks down there tell us they watch CNN, so I know that they appreciate uh, all the coverage we're doing and, and what you're doing as well, Chad, keeping on top of it. Chad Myers, thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Unfolding right now, a frantic search for survivors in the rubble from the Mexico earthquake, why officials believe there are many still alive in nearly a dozen buildings, plus President Trump with a direct warning for any Republican who votes against the health care bill. Will the holdouts listen? And the president calling the Russian troll ads on Facebook a hoax, even though Facebook, Congress, and Robert Mueller all disagree. Just about everybody disagrees. Stay with us. If you it's a race against time in Mexico City as crews frantically try to find survivors from Tuesday's earthquake. It's been three days since the quake struck, but Mexico's president says people could still be trapped and uh, at least uh, alive and trapped. Uh, in 10 buildings there. With each passing hour, however, hopes of seeing more scenes like this are fading. The resilience, though, is unwavering. Uh, listen as rescue crews take a brief break to sing their national anthem. <laughs> Remarkable how everybody is uh, trying to stay uh, in good spirits down there. Let's get straight to CNN's Miguel Marquez live on the ground in Mexico City at the site of one of these searches. Uh, Miguel, have there been any signs of life from what you can see at your vantage point? Officials say there are signs of life in here. They've been able to pick up heat signatures on the back side of the building, but I want to show you this, how delicate this is. There was a stop work order here uh, in Condesa. This is central Mexico City because this building has become so unstable. What's happening now is that Japanese rescue crews, and that may be an Israeli rescue crew that's up on top of the building now, surveying, trying to figure out how they can get ropes, how they can get access to the back side of the building. They say they have heat signatures, possibly for many people, about... Uh, several dozen people are missing and believed possibly in this building. So clearly 72 hours, it is critical that they get uh, in there. The, the problem is how, with the rain that they have had over the last couple of days, it has weighed down the building, all that water, and now it is very, very unstable. So getting into those floors where there might be cavities, where people might still be alive, is extraordinarily difficult. But you have crews from around the world here and an enormous effort to try to make that happen. Jim? Miguel Marquez, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Miguel doing his best. Uh, he's been whispering at those scenes the last few days and doing a lot of work uh, covering uh, that, that quake down there with all our CNN crews. Uh, he's trying to nurse that voice there. Miguel Marquez, thank you very much. Coming up, uh, saving Luther Strange. President Trump steps in to help the Alabama senator who has based his campaign on just one thing, allegiance to the president. Can Trump deliver the votes? Plus, the president not hitting like after Facebook says it will deliver Russia-linked ad to the special counsel. His response, it's all part of an ongoing election hoax. That's according to the president. We'll be right back. President Trump heads to Alabama tonight to step right in the middle of an ugly GOP election battle. It's the Republican primary to fill the Senate seat that used to belong to Attorney General Jeff Sessions. CNN senior national correspondent Alex Marquardt is in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, Alex, the president uh, tweeted this. We'll put this up on screen. We'll be in Alabama tonight. Luther Strange has gained mightily since my endorsement, but we'll be very close. He loves Alabama, and so do I. 
Uh, Alex, uh, the primary is on Tuesday. Uh, the president there setting some expectations that while he has helped in this race, uh, perhaps it won't go his way. Uh, what are you hearing on the ground down there? Well, that is one of the strange twists in this election, that the voters who traditionally turned out for President Trump in this race are going to be going against the candidate uh, that President Trump has not endorsed, Roy Moore. Uh, we know that President Trump has come out in favor of, of Luther Strange repeatedly on Twitter, as you mentioned. He has talked about his loyalty. We all know how important loyalty uh, is to the president. And Luther Strange is very eager to cast himself as the president's man. In last night's debate against Roy Moore, he took every opportunity to talk about how closely aligned with the president he is, how hard he's fighting for the president's agenda in Washington. This is shaping up to be a race of the D.C. Republican establishment against the grassroots. The super PAC aligned with Mitch McConnell has spent millions in uh, TV ads against uh, Luther, against uh, Roy Moore. Many on Capitol Hill in the GOP don't want to see Moore's uh, far right ultra conservative views up there in Washington. We got a taste of his view for the country at last night's debate. Here's what he had to say. I want it free from political correctness and social experimentation like transgender troops in our bathroom and inclusiveness. Our foundation has been shaken. Crime, corruption, immorality, abortion, sodomy, sexual perversion sweep our land. When we become one nation under God again, when liberty and justice for all reigns across our land, we will be truly good again. If we wait on Congress to do everything, we'll lose. It's our business to take care of our business. DACA is wrong. Dreamer is wrong. So more there trying to play up how closely he is also aligned with Trump. We actually just saw a Senator Strange walking past just moments ago. We asked him how he's feeling. He said he's good. He's excited for tonight's event with President Trump, which is right there behind me. And then on Monday, the day before the election, Vice President Mike Pence is also swinging through town uh, to campaign for Luther Strange. So the White House pulling out all the stops in this very tight race. Jim. They are pulling out the stops. Alexander Marquardt, thank you very much. Uh, both Roy Moore and Luther Strange say they support the president's agenda, but Moore says he also wants to free the president from the shackles of the establishment. Listen to this. President Trump's being cut off in his office. He's being redirected by people like McConnell, who do, do not support his agenda, who will not support his agenda in the future. I think we need to go back and look at these things and look at what's going on. Joining me now to talk about this, CNN senior political reporter Nia Malika Henderson, David Drucker, CNN political analyst and senior congressional correspondent for the Washington Examiner, and Chris Saliza, politics reporter and CNN editor at large. Nia, you have the president on one side, Sarah Palin, Sebastian Gorka, Steve Bannon on the other. Uh, talk about stranger things <laughs> down in Alabama. Nice. Well I think played. we're in the upside down. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I love this. But yeah. then we've been there for yeah. a while. We've, so. we've been there. And I mean, not only those folks, right? I mean, it's people like Phil Robertson of Duck Dynasty uh, fame. Sean Hannity uh, has backed uh, Roy Moore. People like uh, James Dobson, evangelical figures uh, like Tony Perkins as well. So it is a very strange uh, kind of makeup and shakeup here of what we usually think of as the president uh, and being aligned with his base. We have what is his real base, white evangelicals, right? I mean, that's who's going to be voting yeah. in this campaign. Uh, and I would really want to see tonight how, how Donald Trump handles this. What does he say about a Luther Strange, a Big Luther, as he calls him? Uh, and what does he say, if anything, about Roy Moore? So that's one of the things I want to look for, as well as what's going to happen in the pews of churches on Sunday, right? Southern Baptist preachers have a way of sort of communicating to their parishioners uh, what they think should happen in, in elections. So that's going to be something that's interesting. I think Roy Moore is, he's a very Trumpian candidate, right? Yeah. I mean, but, but he also sort of sounds like a Baptist preacher when he's there, you know, talking about all the ills of the world due to uh, political correctness. So I think it's going to be a really tough fight. The latest polls I've uh, seen have him up by about eight per, eight, eight, per eight points. Uh, he was up by as much as I think 16 before. So it is tightening, but eight points is still a lot. And David Drucker, is it a loss for the president if Luther Strange loses on Tuesday? Well, yeah, it's a loss for the president. I think the president, uh, from the Republican point of view, is commended for actually investing in his endorsement instead of just a couple of tweets. He's going down there. He's laying some of his political capital on the line. 
I don't think that Republican voters are going to hold, respons hold the president responsible if he loses. But I do think Republicans in Washington are watching this very closely. Exactly how much juice does the president have with his base? And Alabama is ground zero for the Trump Republican mm -hmm. base. I think the other thing to watch here and why are uh, Republicans in town so worried about more, it's not because he's conservative or ultra conservative. He would basically vote the way they vote 90% of the time. It's his, let's just say, controversial rhetoric on social issues. This would be like Todd Aiken from Missouri winning a Senate seat, saying things that are intemperate, and Republicans across the country in 2018 are going to be forced to answer for things that Moore is going to be able to amplify with the platform of a U.S. Senate seat. And that is why Republicans in town have spent so much money. Senate Leadership Fund spent $9 million to elect Luther Strange. It's a huge investment. Yeah. And, and one of the reasons why they did that, it's not just because Strange is the incumbent. It's because their choices here right. are basically you either have Luther Strange or you have this rebel radical that yeah. is going to cause them nothing but trouble. And Chris, uh, how much... Does it help the president persuade his these Republican senators uh, to go along with him on health care when he is backing somebody like Luther Strange? Is there a, maybe a connection yeah, there I, where it helps him in that regard? I think for your average person, they would think no. But anyone who spent any time in Washington, the answer is, is probably at the margins it helps. Yeah. Um, because Luther Strange is one of them. And I think you have to remember that the Senate is a very exclusive club. So, yes, Democrats and Republicans fight. Yes, certain people in the Republican conference don't like Mitch McConnell. But at the end of the day, if you support someone who is not incumbent, in their mind, they think, oh, he could do that to me. So, yeah, I think it helps at the margins. Do I think it gets Susan Collins to vote for the Graham Cassidy repeal and play? No. I mean, I, I don't yeah. think it does that. I still do, Nia mentioned this, I still do think if you go back, I will be very interested, particularly if Luther Strange loses, to go back and read a uh, the genesis of the Trump decision to support Strange. I assume Mitch McConnell was heavily involved in it, but Moore is so much more tonally a Trump-like candidate yeah. um, that if he gets nothing from supporting Luther Strange, neither a win nor any sort of goodwill among senators, my guess is he will, he Donald Trump will take to Twitter and make some of his, as he often does, yeah. and make make some of his views known. Yeah, speaking of tweets, uh, speaking of tweets, Nia, let's uh, look at the tweet that the president fired off this morning about uh, Rand Paul. Rand Paul, whoever votes against health care bill, will forever uh, in future political campaigns be known as the Republican who saved Obamacare. Uh, talk about not helping things very much. Yeah, and it's certainly not going to matter to Rand Paul. I mean, Rand Paul, uh, we've known where he's all, uh, he is on this bill for for some time, and right. uh, you know, I mean, he, he doesn't he doesn't really uh, matter in terms of what's going to happen to this. I think the question, uh, Chris talked about Lisa Murkowski, John McCain, uh, Susan Collins. Where are they going to be? Lisa Murkowski in Alaska. She's going to be meeting with folks on the ground there. Uh, topic number one, I'm sure, is going to be health care. So I think those are the conversations that are going to matter uh, in this. The president it hasn't really been that helpful either way uh, in terms of what happened last time and convincing those folks. And I don't think they're looking to him uh, at this point either. To yeah, he's not going folks. down to Alabama to give a health care speech right, right. to exactly. save Graham going, Cassidy. Yeah. He is going down there to intervene in the Senate race with time running out on health care. It's, it's kind of incredible. But I want to switch gears because this is a very important story. Talk about the swamp. Uh, as I like to say, same swamp, different alligators. Uh, HHS Secretary Tom Price and his pension for uh, private planes. The uh, HHS Inspector General is now investigating Price and his travel preferences. Uh, Price has taken a number of private jet flights, around uh, two dozen or so at taxpayer expense, uh, all while they're talking about uh, potentially uh, taking millions of people out of the health care system. Uh, David, I mean, does that resonate at all this uh, outside is, of the, the Beltway? Yeah, well, I think, I think it does because it's the kind of misuse of government funds where you have figures in Washington doing things that normal people don't do that helped drive a lot of what we saw in 2016, whether it was on the left for Bernie Sanders or on the right for Donald Trump. And look, Tom Price, when he was a member of Congress and chairman of the Budget Committee, he would have gone crazy, and rightfully so, if Kathleen yep. Sebelius, who was Obama's right. first HHS secretary, would have been running around the country on private planes while she was busy pushing the Affordable Care Act. And Chris, just yeah. very quickly, because we have to go, does this put Tom Price in trouble, do you think? Are we have we You've seen many of these rounds before. Are uh, we there yet? You would think it would in a, in a traditional presidency. The problem is the things that tend to put you in trouble in the Trump presidency is disloyalty to Donald Trump and a little bit getting bad press that reflects poorly on Donald Trump. So if it blows 
up bigger and the HHS IG investigation makes it more likely it will blow up bigger, yes. But if it is portrayed as, well, he's just under attack by the media and it's a double standard, then he'll be fine. Then he'll be fine. Yeah. Okay, Neil Malik Henderson, David Drucker, Chris Eliza, thank you very much. Appreciate it. A programming note, speaking of health care, be sure to watch this Monday for a CNN town hall event. Uh, Democratic Senators Bernie Sanders and Amy Klobuchar debate Republican Senators Lindsey Graham and Bill Cassidy on health care and the new Graham-Cassidy bill. Uh, that is this Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, watch the sparks fly. Uh, coming up, one man's evidence is another man's hoax. Another man being the president. The president comes out swinging against Facebook and those online ads linked to the Kremlin. Uh, plus, unfolding right now, a frantic search for survivors in the rubble from the Mexico earthquake will take you to this collapsed building where they hope to see uh, signs of life. And they're, in fact, seeing some signs of life. We'll get back to that as soon as we can. Just when you thought President Trump was in agreement that Russia meddled in the 2016 election, well, he reverts back to calling it a phony story. The president responded to the news that Facebook is turning over Russia ads to Congress with this tweet. Here it is. The Russia hoax continues. Now it's ads on Facebook. What about the totally bi biased and dishonest media coverage in favor of who he calls crooked Hillary? Uh, that contradicts, uh, we should point out, what his national security advisor told our Chris Cuomo. We have to find these areas of cooperation with Russia, even as we confront their destabilizing behavior. And just to be clear on the record there, I want you to uh, have the opportunity for this. The questions about what they did, who might have helped them, and how to stop it, you believe those are all legitimate questions for us to look at? Of course, and so, and so does the president. But it depends on the day, it seems. Uh, let's bring in CNN political director David Chalian. It's like deja vu all over again. Uh, David, what do you make of the president's back and forth over whether Russia meddled in the election? Uh, he just can't seem to stay with a consistent answer on this. He can't because he can't get out of his mind the notion that anything related to Ru Russia somehow calls into the legitimacy of his election as president. He can't separate those two things, Jim. He, can, he just seems incapable of it. So he has at times conceded, yes, it's Russia. Fine, let's move on. Uh, but it's never consistent. And here today, he's back calling it a hoax. And we have some new CNN polling released uh, about this hour, uh, or just this hour, about Russia and the election. Uh, what do the numbers show? It's pretty remarkable. Yeah, take a look right there. You see that a majority of the country, 54% of Americans, say that it is likely that the Russian-backed content on social media did indeed affect the outcome in 2016. But like everything else, Jim, in American life, partisanship drives so much of this. Look at the difference among partisans. Among Democrats, 82% think it's likely that Russia back content on social media affected the outcome. 55% of independents, only 15% of Republicans wow. believe that. So you just see where you stand ideologically really determines how you see this. And is it possible when people hear uh, the question asked, if you're a Republican on the line and you hear that question asked, that you just automatically feel compelled to say, no, okay, I don't believe this. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt. There's that dynamic. There's, there's no think. doubt yeah. that happens because you, you yeah. view it that way. One other finding in this poll yeah. that we have, we asked people, do you know somebody personally that changed their vote because they saw some of this Russian back content? And that is a whole different story. Mm. Only 11% of Americans say, yes, they know someone that changed their vote. Uh, even though, as we just showed, a majority of the country does believe this stuff had an impact on the outcome. But 11 percent, OK, 11 percent said yes. But as we know, it was not a very large number of votes in three very key states that determined the outcome of this election. And Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by three million votes. So 11 percent could have had an impact. Uh, the, uh, perhaps those are 11 percent is saying, I know someone personally that changed. Yeah. And you're right. If it, yeah. in the right places, it certainly could have had an impact. Actually. This is what Mark Warner uh, on the Democratic side is looking at on the Senate Intelligence Committee. All right. Doesn't sound like a hoax to everybody else. Uh, David Chalian, thank you very much. Uh, coming up, we're staying on top of the breaking news, a race against time after that major earthquake in Mexico. Search teams holding out hope. People are still alive in the rubble of nearly a dozen buildings. Uh, we will take you to one of them. Coming up. President Trump's critics say his use of Twitter is often not presidential. The president would rather call his use of social media modern-day presidential. In a CNN special tonight, correspondent Bill Weir examines the relationship between Trump and Twitter, and he traces the evolution of presidential communications from the past to the present. But as communication evolved, the presidents we remember took existing tools and made them their own. Teddy Roosevelt courted cartoonists in a whole new way. FDR spoke into a radio microphone. This is war. Like no president before. 
and it became mandatory listening and everybody would lean forward and hear what the president had to say. Give me a chance, will you please? And while Truman and Eisenhower were the first on TV, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, JFK and Reagan tear down this wall are considered the best. The President of the United States tweeting new criticism. This was delivered on Twitter. President Trump tweeted this, uh, quote, which brings us to number 45. I'll do it verbally, I'll do it on television, I'll do it on Twitter. We've gone from uh, FDR's fireside chats to President Trump's fiery tweets. Uh, Bill Weir joins <laughs> us live. Uh, it's hard to have this conversation without talking about the Twitter, isn't it? It is, and it, it becomes such a, I guess, part of our wallpaper these days, Jim, that I wanted to sort of take a, take a sweeping view of this through history, the idea that all of these tweets compiled will be studied for centuries. He has reinvented presidential communication like few before him, and uh, that comes with a cost, of course. We're going to get into the pros and cons tonight. And just today we've seen tweets, uh, Bill, from the president referring to crooked Hillary. We know who that's about, uh, calling North Korean leader Kim Jong-un a madman and criticizing Republicans who oppose the current health care bill. Uh, is there a downside, do you think, uh, for the president to rely on social media so much? It, it hasn't appeared to be a downside for him up to this point. Well, this is the guy who, is, who has defied political gravity since he came down the, uh, the escalator. Uh, and you would think that it'll be a tweet too far that sinks him in. You talk to, I talk to presidential historians like Douglas Brinkley, who's convinced the machine that helped make him uh, will be his undoing. Uh, you, of course, got the drums of war beating that you have there calling him a madman, a rocket man in North Korea. A lot of concern that those could be misconstrued, which would bring us to the brink closer than any sort of one-on-one -on -one diplomacy. There's also the legal jeopardy he puts himself in. Uh, people say, you know, Twitter's different. You should take uh, what he says there differently than when he's at a different podium. Uh, even his detractors will say, no, 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 this is his unfiltered id. This is, a, this is the most clarified look we have into the intentions of this man when he's tweeting at 6 a.m. watching cable news. So let him, don't take a phone away. Uh, so that's what's so intriguing about this. Minute to minute, we're watching to see which one will grab the news cycle and which one could ultimately either elevate or, or lay him low. Okay. Hard to imagine scholars studying this for decades to come, uh, but Bill Weir, we're glad you're on the case. Uh, Bill Weir, thank you very much. Be sure to watch Bill's special report, Trump and Twitter. Twitter and Trump, uh, that is tonight at 9 Eastern right here at CNN. Coming up, new insults and new threats between Kim Jong-un and President Trump. Did the nuclear standoff just get worse? A live report is next, plus live pictures of a textile factory that collapsed in the Mexico earthquake. Crews there are trying to save people trapped and rubble there will uh, get you uh, there live in just a few moments. Stand by, uh, and thanks for watching.